delighted to, to invite her on board as well. The way we designed the project was that we would work with groups of about six to eight children uh, who were a two year time or the first year or second, just before the ages vary according to, to countries. But most of all, they were children who had their primary education interrupted by a journey from, a, from their country of origin. Now, we had to be flexible with this. Uh, it was very difficult to, to, to um, keep to these criteria, you know, completely strict to this criteria, because the, the teachers, for example, invited some of the other children to join in, whose circumstances were slightly different, or the children themselves wanted to join, and we didn't want to say no. In Glasgow and in Barcelona, we also worked with groups of indigenous children, that is, children who had grown up and, and lived either in Barcelona or children who lived in, in Glasgow, because we wanted to have that kind of contrast too. So we were flexible, but at the same time, we had enough uh, uh, features that were similar so that we could lay in shape. Sarah, Chris, and I. That's my key and my voice was cut. <laughs> so in, in Glasgow, two schools participated and uh, uh, with 20 children. And you see there the countries represented, Congo, Rwanda, Siberia, uh, including Scottish kids and England kids. In Barcelona, there was one school with 12 children, but in reality, they were doing a gigantic project with many schools and many children. But for this project, they focus on these 12 children. Um, there you have children from Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, Romania, Morocco, and Catalonia. Then in Arizona, I did it with a group of six children in only one school. It was an after school uh, kind of activity, while in the other context, some of the uh, part of the research was conducted within the, the classroom. Uh, I did it after school. It was on a voluntary basis. Those kids who met the criteria and wanted to come, except for the girl from Iraq, who uh, I wanted to keep it within Latinos, just because I have been working with Latino children. But she wanted to join, and the same as it happened to them, I couldn't say no when a student comes to you and say, "Can I participate from the reading?" Yeah, yeah. So uh, it turned out actually to be great because she was the only one who didn't speak Spanish in the group. So we were forced to make the discussion <coughs> bilingual. And then in Italia, there were eight children in one school. And uh, there are different countries also represented even within such small groups. Uh, Philippines, Peru, Poland, Bangladesh, Italy, Thailand, and Italian, Peru one. And so, so this, this diversity was actually very rich. And um, so we will move now to the research methods. Evelyn. Thank you, Catherine. So yes, so we wanted to use methods that would not uh, pose limits to the children in any way or frighten them in terms of having to use language they didn't feel comfortable with. We focused, therefore, on oral discussion but also on visual methods. Uh, as I said, we wanted to, uh, of course, be culturally responsive, and that in both uh, concentrations of, of um, children that participated. Mm -hmm. Evelyn, uh, we are losing a little bit of what you are saying. It is coding, so I think that I will take the video, one of the videos, I will take the video off, but it, we will be able to hear her, okay? Because we know that when we shut off the video, then it doesn't happen, supposedly. Yeah. So, so you will listen to her, okay? Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. We can agree on that. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Let's see. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, we one of the one of the uh, books that. Uh, started us off was the book that I wrote with Morag Styles, uh, Children Reading Pictures. We adapted some of the techniques that we used in that research. But more than anything, the strategies were used to, were designed to provide opportunities for the children to enjoy the texts and to also encourage. 
children make predictions about the text. We then moved on to further discussion, more in-depth discussion, as the children completed walkthroughs of the book. Now, this is quite a long book, and not all the groups of children uh, managed to get through the whole book. Some focused more on the first part of the book. The next strategy was the use of annotated spreads. And this involved providing the children with an opportunity to look more closely at a particular image, almost like freezing the image, if you like. And they could comment on it in their own words. This provided us with a glimpse of their thought processes as they read the pictures. Uh, we selected images that were crucial to understanding the narrative, and children uh, select from those images, children selected the ones that, I, that they wanted to, to talk about, that they were personally interested in. These images were pasted on larger sheets of paper, and the children could write in the margins, drawing arrows to reference their comments. The example you have there is of a girl from Bangladesh who, worked with us, who was with us in Glasgow. Uh, she knew a bit of English when she had arrived, but she'd really only been in the country for three months, and she was going through a kind of silent period. When we gave her this task to do, she just, as you can see, she's just um, written everywhere, and in fact, she wanted to keep writing, so she asked me for another sheet of paper, and as you see on the next slide, she kept writing. And I just wanted to point out one of the things I really liked about her response was sort of halfway down the page, she writes, he was tense because he don't know what people says, and I think that was a very personal response of hers to this book. After the annotations, we used uh, graphic strips, and we asked the children to draw a, a, their own journey. They didn't have to draw their, their journey from their own country, they could just draw a journey, but a lot of them did choose to draw their own journeys. Uh, and they used the layout, as you can see in the uh, image there, very similar to the one that Shontan uses, particularly when he's drawing and illustrating his, uh, the little subplots that form part of the arrival. Each child was invited to talk through these graphic strips, and the other children asked them questions, and uh, asked them how they had come to these uh, drawings. And the children really enjoyed doing that. Okay, Carmen, over to you. So one, once we had all of the students' responses orally and through the annotations, uh, each team uh, started analyzing the data uh, based mostly on their experience on how to analyze oral responses to text. Although we had some initial talk and we shared some reader response frameworks, we know the word of Lawrence Seif and, and others. But each team worked individually first. Then we met to share what we had found. And in that meeting, we tried then to make decisions, as Teresa said at the beginning, to try to systematize the children's responses across context. And so we put together the main categories from each country, and then we came up with this uh, list that you have here of four main categories. Uh, one with the children just talked about the text, the preferential one, then those responses that related to the children's experience, that they talk about them, uh, those responses in which they focus on the art of the book, and then their intertextual and intercultural connections. But uh, at that meeting, and it was in, in Barcelona, we, uh, had identified, some of the teams actually, had identified two levels of responses in the books. Ones that we ended up calling literal statements, the first, the second column, and the third, inferential statements. So in the first, uh, the literal kinds of statements, the children uh, responded more to the what of the book. In the second column, usually they responded to the why. So they gave a response, but they elaborated, or there was some uh, deeper uh, elaboration on the initial comment. Um, however, our conceptualization of the categories actually, uh, especially of the preferential category, evolved. 
because once we made the decision, okay, we will go back to the data, and we each, we look again at the data, at each corpus of data, with these lenses of the four main categories and the two responses of literal and inferential. So we went back, and what happened was that suddenly we realized how difficult it was to differentiate between a literal response and an inferential response and an inference because the text doesn't have print or hardly have print, just on the title. So basically, when we started looking, even the most simple comment like, oh, there is the, there is the mother, that was an inference because it was a woman, she could have been the aunt, the grandmother, a friend of the family. So even the most simple responses involved a level of inferences. And that made us to go back and look again at the data now using inferences as our umbrella category to approach the, the others that we had identified. And it seems that the wordless and complex nature of a text such as the arrival defies categories that have been created, created mostly for texts in which the story is, to, is told through both written text and images. Therefore, as we work to understand the student's reading process, we found more illuminating to think of the fluidity of the categories. And our analysis led us to realize that even the most basic retelling involved interpretive work and a level of inference. And that really helped to, to that made justice actually to the sophisticated responses that the children were given. Um, and so, uh, I am moving to the second part of the book that addresses the nature of the student responses. And, um, and because I just mentioned the inferences, uh, we will talk a little bit about that later. But you have, for example, this, this image, um, this uh, spread in the book. And um, I chose it now for this presentation and we talk about it because it really uh, um, allowed us to see the student's interpretive processes uh, in action. So for the, for the students in Barcelona, I like one, one discussion that they had one day. So the mediator or the teacher asked, emigrantes, ¿sabéis qué significa? Emigrant, do you know what it means? And one of the child says, nosotros que venimos de Rumania y entramos en otro país, es eso, emigrantes. So we, who come from Romania and arrive to another country, that is immigrant. So, eh, the way that these students in Barcelona positioned themselves right from the start as immigrants uh, was very telling for us. It was different than the way that the kids in Glasgow and Barcelona positioned themselves because they never, not mine, and said that they were immigrants or anything. My, my kids didn't have that positioning. Um, we think that in part, uh, perhaps the title of the actual book in Spanish, Emigrantes versus the arrival in English, just gave a hint to the kids. Um, or maybe the political context and educational programs in each country played a role in how the children saw themselves in the host country. Or maybe the children in Arizona where there are so many Latinos, the population is really high, who have lived there forever, so they didn't see themselves as outsiders. We don't know, but there were some nuanced differences in how the kids positioned themselves. Nonetheless, even if the Glasgow and Arizona groups of children did not explicitly self-identify as either immigrants or immigrants, through their sharing of personal experiences, we learn a great deal about their awareness and understanding of the reasons that may lead or force people to move, and about the experiences many of them, their relatives or people they knew, had lived as immigrants. And I wanted to share uh, two of uh, the responses uh, from my kids, of two childs in my group, to this image. So these people are actually in the boat, so they are arriving to the harbor. And then I asked them to draw their prediction of what was going to happen next. 
and these were two drawings from the children. So here we have Anna, the girl from Iraq. So she uh, gave a long narrative about what the picture is about, but um, the point that I want to highlight here is that she drew people really happy arriving to the new country, and there you have someone that says, welcome to the Chambolet. Mm -hmm. it, I drew a hotel, she said. Uh, so, uh, and then he has uh, his suitcase, and they are happy, and then she comments um, later in a different discussion, oh, I travel like three or four places just on an airplane from my country to Jordan. I stayed for a year there, and I traveled to places I don't know, and a hotel, travel, a hotel, travel, until I got to America. I traveled to states, states, and then we went to my house. So it was clear for me that uh, Amal was drawing on her own experiences as an immigrant who came via airplane, stayed at a hotel, had suitcase, and in the gen in general, had a very positive take on this experience. And then this is Ryan. This is the Mexican boy, and he also explained his picture. But the point that I want to highlight here is that when he explained his picture, he said that the man was arriving and he was going to see his relatives who were waiting for him. So he stayed didn't include a hotel, didn't include like just coming for a while or visiting. For him, the family was waiting for the immigrant. And it, it, well, we know that uh, one of the main reasons for immigration uh, is family reunification. And so for me, that might be reflected in this response. Um, so uh, you could see how in their oral responses and in their pictures and in their written responses, the kids were making inferences on the pictures based on their own lived experiences, based on what the text provided. Um, but they also uh, talked, we also focused on the content of their discussions and they talked a lot about immigration. Even if they didn't identify themselves as, as immigrants, some of them, they talk about the hardships of the immigrant experience, and that is detailed in one of the chapters. Um, becoming bilingual, gaining and losing languages, negotiating an immigrant identity, silence and appropriation, because we had studies in which the kids distanced them, distance themselves, especially in Spain, from being an immigrant. And we also had in Barcelona kids who said, is that, I just wonder if my, if my father or my grandfather went through this because he never talked about that. They don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So we have this silence and at the same time, this appropriation that yes, we are migrant, uh, immigrants and we come here to work. So they, they were really uh, strong on that. And reclaiming unique knowledge as immigrants. Also some children said it is not the same to imagine as to feel. Yes, we can talk to you about immigration a lot and you can get to learn, but it is not the same to imagine as to feel, one of the girls said. And then, uh, as part of the second part of the book also, we, um, then we focus more closely on the types of retelling and inferences that the kids were making. I just saw an example through the two pictures, but I just wanted to summarize that um, if in the four countries, the process of making inferences about the text involved offering possible explanations, tentative explanations, hearing back from other students, coaching responses from interviewers, looking forward and backward in the book for more clues, and reformulating the inference. The children knew that we were not looking for the right answer. It was a time for inquiry and exploring, and they could take risks on doing that. Often they seem to know that the interpretation it was only a tentative suggestion up for negotiation. And then the kids involved in the negotiation of meaning. And one added a detail, no, because look at this picture. And um, so they built in each other until 
some of their uh, predictions or the, their interpretations could be revised or confirmed or dismissed. And then, uh, as part of the inferences, yes, so some of them were based on their own experience or of their knowledge of history or uh, on their visual literacies because the kids know how to read images. Um, but also on popular culture. And I wanted to share this brief quote with you from the kids uh, from Glasgow, working with Evelyn because I really love it. Uh, in this, in, at this time, the kids said, I think he, the, the traveler, he got his documents or a gun, say, in his suitcase. And he was from a mafia family. So the mediator asked about the mafia. Where did you see that about the mafia? And he said, because I got a game, mafia, an Xbox game, and they have clothes like this. <laughs> so even popular culture, video games, personal experiences, visual literacy, the affordances of the text, all mediated the children's inferences, and they were very rich. And now, Evelyn, yes. you, you continue with the intertextual. Okay. Uh, the the uh, the, six, the chapter six, sorry, in the second part uh, follows a bit from what Carmen was saying about these intertextual references. We wanted to explore these references more fully. So at first we began to just identify all of the references where the children made intertextual links. Some of the ones that Carmen has already mentioned, uh, films, books, uh, all sorts of uh, video games, whatever it was. However, we began to notice that these comments tended to cluster around specific points or themes in the text. And this suggested to us that Hans Schottan's technique of moving from the strange and exotic to the familiar um, prompted the children to engage in this intertextual meaning making, partly as a way of making sense out of the unfamiliar. So, geographically speaking, we all need a new landmarks to orientate ourselves in a new landscape. And this is what the readers were doing, we felt, when they encountered these, this text. They were drawn to landmarks within the text that resonated with their own cultural repertoire. These landmarks acted as a, as a point of navigation, which helped the children to construct a path through the text. So they would find the images of the arrival that fitted with their prior experiences or knowledge, and then they would share these with the others. While they all had their own landmarks, we found that the one common connection from every single country was mention of the film Titanic. And this was probably inspired uh, by these pictures of the boat arriving and by the immigrants. However, as you can see in the next slide, which has some different excerpts from some of the different countries, you can see that the children made the link that would help them understand this particular uh, intertextual landmark. For example, in uh, the quote from Barcelona from Gabriel, he says that uh, he was, he, he was looking to understand the social status of the people on the ship. So he knew that there were different categories of immigrants, the rich people above, the poorer people below. Whereas for Joseph and for Viviana in Arizona, they were trying to understand the compositional aspects of Sean Tan's portrayal of the ship uh, from this perspective of zooming out or zooming in. And Viviana is dealing with the man's feelings. He, he, she speaks of the fact that he feels sad when he's looking at his family photograph. So this particular reference meant different things to them, but at the same time, it connected to them. And I'm going to move on to the next uh, aspect, which is engaging with the visual affordances, which follows from this quite nicely, because in engaging with those visual affordances, the color, perspective, the children also deepened their understanding of what was going on with this immigrant experience. The first example
example here is from Barcelona, and it's really quite simple. It's about the colors. The children were all very intrigued about why Shontan had chosen this rather dark brown color. You perceive it wasn't a very colorful book, especially when they compared it with that of Blossom, which is very bright colored. But Emma, for example, said uh, he chose these colors because if you want a book to look old, then everything should match it a bit. We can't pretend the book is old and have color photographs. So she understood that this illustrator was was had an intention that was leading him in one particular way to create a context, to create an, an emotion, uh, a particular mood for, for the reader. The next example is about perspective. Now, the children often didn't have these vocabulary terms. And in some countries, the mediators were quite keen to uh, give them these tools so that they could talk about the images. So the example of perspective, as you can see, is zooming in, uh, uh, sorry, zooming out from the photograph that the man is looking at. And we zoom out until we see him through the window, and then we see the whole ship on the ocean. And this is an example from Arizona. This excerpt where they are talking about that particular page. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can see that uh, they're making an inter intertextual reference to Flotsam because Flotsam is about photographs and in fact the cover has a, a round hole like the eye of the camera that Wiesner plays with. And also in Flotsam, there is the use of zooming. Pictures look bigger, bigger, smaller, 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 and extra smaller. And then they go back to the arrival and they talk about the picture of a train, which is we don't have there on the PowerPoint slide, but where you can see the train getting smaller and smaller as it goes away into the distance. As Alma says, they're moving, moving, moving. So the children here are learning, have learned about the technique of zooming in their discussion of Flotsam. And although they didn't name it here, they did recognize it in the images in the arrival. And again, we can't go into all of the different aspects of the visual uh, techniques that Sean Tan uses and that the children refer to, but that was clearly an important part of making sense of a narrative that doesn't have any words. Carmen? Yes. So the third part of the book is about mediation and pedagogy. And uh, that chapter is especially oriented toward um, teachers who may want to consider using wordless text in, in their room. And in that chapter, we talked about adult mediation, but also about children as mediators of each others. Basically, we are drawing on a social cultural perspective to learning using Vygotsky's concept of mediation, in which all learning is socially and culturally, historically mediated. And we um, try to focus on that in that chapter and be specific about the ways in which the adults mediated the children's talk. We had lots of questions. We actually had some initial guides of uh, interesting questions per page. We didn't use the guides, but we had those questions there in critical places so that we could move the discussion forward. We basically wanted open-ended questions that gave the students the freedom to engage with the images in whatever way they wanted. Um, so there were different types of questions, and we talk about them in that chapter. I especially appreciate the way that the children mediated each other's conversation. And in one of the excerpts that we presented, you could actually see the kids building on each other. Uh, but we had many explicit references in which the children were actually uh, asking questions to each other, uh, pointing to different details of the pictures, and show how they are uh, inquirers and problem uh, posers, not just problem solvers. Um, and we talk about image-based strategies for inclusive pedagogy. And that is a section that Evelyn made reference as part of the methodology of the research, but it's also a pedagogical tool. And we explain how to work it with the children. And uh, if we think of, OK, so what did we learn from this study? Uh, we learned a lot of things, but we want to highlight these three aspects. Our research confirms that the wordless picture books demand a heightened co-authoring role 
that requires taking risks with imagination, activating intertextual and cultural knowledge, using all of these to make inferences while at the same time being open to constantly revising interpretation and meaning. And we want that for our children. We want for them to be able to do that in text with print. And what a wonderful thing that in a text that doesn't have print, they actually are engaging in those same thinking processes. Uh, given the right context, we argue, one that focus more on meaning making than on getting the right response, or one that uh, allows uh, language attempts uh, to talk instead of expecting language proficiency, recent immigrant children can engage in social literate practices and interpretive processes. They come equipped, it doesn't matter their background, they can transact with the images and make sense. And lastly, by building on tan sophisticated visual art and the immigrant children's visual literacy skills, we were able to overcome some of the challenges to learning recent immigrants and teachers may experience, as well as to cross cultural borders. Because many teachers don't know if the children know how to read, if they can make meaning well. So we were able to document that even if they don't control still the mainstream language of the country, they not only have linguistic resources of their own, but they have the ability to uh, express themselves and make sense of the images. And um, uh, we want Evelyn to, to make some highlights about the collaborative nature of our project, and then we will listen from Marcela's experience who joined the project a little bit later. Evelyn, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, Finally, when we were writing, 
the nuances of academic writing is, is, is really quite different in each country. The style, the expectations of what you put into an academic piece. So it really was, uh, and then these had to be translated into English, and the whole book had to be given a consistent voice, but without losing those other voices as well. It was important that we were a very diverse team, some of us uh, immigrants ourselves, uh, and I think this reflects this new cosmopolitan collaborative inquiry, which is also a form of intercultural exchange and learning. And the most important thing for me was the creation of a convivial space for collaborative inquiry. We were able to meet up several times personally, not just by video, and this was really very enriching and, and also a lot of fun. Um, Marcella will uh, now move us to her experience in, in Italy. With pleasure. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Well, first of all, I want to say maybe I will come there. Come over here, yeah. so I can yeah. know it. So first of all, I really want to thank you, uh, Evelyn, Carmen, and Teresa, to uh, welcome me and voices coming from Italy. So not just my voice, but the voice of my colleague that you can see here, George Aguirre, and the voices of the children that we involved in the project. So thank you very much for being really inclusive in this project, even in the academic point of view. I'm so happy that I had the chance to be here and accept the invitation of Columbia University and being in New York and to see you all mm -hmm. here. So what I will do is to take you a little while in the, in the Italian trip that was made after some meeting with the twin people. So the first of this meeting for me very important was in 2010. We were in Santiago de Compostela in Spain for the International Congress of the EB, International Board on Books for Young People. And there I was just attending a workshop with Evelyn Elizabeth and, and Carmen. And I was following this beautiful way to look at wordless books and to look at readers of so inviting them to co-construct the meaning, the meaning of the images they were seeing, to negotiate this meaning, to write it down this meaning, to put their references, their confidences in what they saw. So it was just attending, but after that, I had the chance to speak with these wonderful scholars, and, and they were so welcoming to me that I said, sure, we can go on with it, maybe you can join and because I was working with picture books at the time in Italy. So we can say that we met in this book, in a way. So a uh, wordless book was a place, uh, or like a playground, or a country, a landscape, and in its horizon, we had the chance to exp express ourselves. And, sorry, so there were other steps, because now I go, I go very fast, of course, but there is another trip, another journey, that was very important for me. In 2012, we saw each other again, and then we sat on a table talking and discussing it. It's the most beautiful thing you can do with people with different perspectives about the multiple perspective of things. So it's a little of a, a game, but it's really what our work has to do with, what education has to work with. So uh, we were sitting there, and yes, we said, okay, just let, let, let's do that. Let, let's. Let's go on with it. And they also involved the, the Italian thing. So now, after uh, two years, we have this wonderful book. This is beautiful because this is such an experience that put us all together with many different voices of migrants. So I want to introduce you the children that we were, that were traveling with me and Georgia Grigli. I, um, I work at the University of Bologna, which is also well known for the Bologna Children's Book Fair, which is an important venue in children publishing. And I, uh, so I involved the primary school class. So we had these uh, kids as all the other kids of the, the journey, they were 10 years old, coming from different places. So you see them. Uh, we took our time in a beautiful place where normally they would have done activities related to drama, to theater. And they were very happy to join because they were cho chosen because of their Competence. They knew more than others because they are travelers, they're, they're migrants, and they know different languages. So for one time, they were not you know, aimed to be 
someone to help with Italian, for example, but someone that knows more than others and then can express himself or herself in a different way. So it was really amazing to see how they co-construct, meaning, well, uh, the, the research, we have been listening about it, and uh, I, I went through, again, you know, back to our experiences. It's just wonderful when you see children speaking one with the other, as you were pointing out, uh, Carmen. For me, this was a very important thing. They were co-constructing the meeting, and they were also learning how to listen to someone else, to express yourself, risk to express yourself, and then correct, integrate what you think with what another person thinks. That is building community, that is building our storytelling of ourselves. So uh, we had different exercises and different things that we've done. And you see uh, also in our, in our class they were doing their like notebooks. And every one of, our, of them, they really wanted to put their picture in the cover. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. So here they just, they just exchanged it. And I like it very much because what you were saying was exactly to go into our lives, our experiences, and match it with imaginary things and with imaginary horizon that gives us voice because otherwise we have no voice. So um, the thing that I, I, I brought as an example of what happens and uh, also refers to the Titanic issue that we saw before. So what we see, Bruno Munari, who is a very important intellectual that talked about uh, wordless book and children's books, he said that we see what we know. We recognize things we know, okay? So we project what we know in reference, this was one of the categories. So here you see, do you know the book? Everyone, uh, any one of you know the book? It's going around. Some of you. Okay, so these, these guys, who are they? We, we asked the children who they can be. They were like, they're famous people. Like, anyway, they were putting the, they're old people because it's a little bit yellowish. And they're, you know, famous <coughs> for something. And then someone started to recognize someone. And so they were like, there is Johnny Depp. <laughs> you know, Johnny Depp. And there is uh, Obama, uh, Osama, Obama bin Laden, and uh, <laughs> uh, crazy thing like this. So uh, we were, okay, if this was very fun, because this was our common word being projected in this book that became a mirror for ourselves and for our culture. But there was a passage I really liked. It was this one. After, you know, this doesn't come just after the, the previous image. It comes after, like, 10 pages, something like this. Okay, just just before the bay that you saw, a little bit before the bay. So we are on a big ferry. These people is traveling. We are following a man who left his, ch his child and his wife. So we are with him on the boat, on the ferry. And so we had seen these famous migrant travelers, people before. And then we see this. And we go with children. But what do you think? Why? Author put this in the page. What does what does this spread mean, or what does it uh, inspire to you? And they were saying many different things, and they co-construct a meaning of the meaning of something which I thought was highly, highly poetical, because what they said suddenly was like about was like, well, this is the same number, you know, of images of frames that we had before with the travelers. The other one goes like, yes, yes, it's true, true. And so maybe, you know, it's like people like, you know, when you're like wondering about things, you just look up in the sky, and maybe you see your own sky, you see your own clouds, because you have your own hopes. This is very beautiful, isn't it? So this would be like a glance to the multiple, to the diversity of our wish, to their similarity as well. So an idea of getting from an ambiguous st stimulus, right? Because it's not, I mean, you, you know it's cloud, but it can be anywhere. You can put your meaning in it. You can put your story and your confidence about the world. And also your poetic, your, the poetry that you feel in everything else. So things like this happened a lot. And uh, the, the experience you see was like this. This is, was, these are some of the images, for example, one of the, of the issue was when you don't understand what they're talk, what they're telling you, what do you do? So the gestures, you know, Italian are very much like this. You know, everybody say Italian, they do like this. 
and, and this guy is, is from Thailand, and this is uh, from Romania, and uh, Brizio from Philippines will do, ah, what? To say no, he doesn't understand. And, well, it's, uh, so, uh, it's being connected between people and universes in this, in this experience that's all about that. And another great connection was always in 2012 with Xiao Tang, which we met at the Congress and who actually offered himself to write the most beautiful preface we have in the book. And you know, he is an artist, he was awarded with many important awards and also an Oscar for the animation. He's just an incredible artist. And so generous, and he said, yes, I really want it. And really like the work we've done. And uh, in the, for the preface, this is just to, to show how beautiful is this connection. Also, Evelyn was saying it before, it's also the diversity of academic styles and studies, you know? So for example, here, this is an Italian magazine. And uh, for example, here, I translated the preface of Shantan. But we're, we are all here, you, you see, we're all together. So with Evelyn, Teresa, Carmen, and this is just to say that was really something very challenging. You know, it's not easy. We take risk, as we were saying before. We take risk to go in uncertainty places. So, um, uh, what 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 Shantan was was writing there in this beautiful preface that I invite you to read is that also artists they just aim to build connection. This is what he says, and it's really beautiful. So he says we don't want to do other things. We we want to look together th uh, at things. So what happens when we are with children in front of wordless books is that language get another important importance. No, suddenly it, it it's when you it's like when you look at a wonderful landscape and you're like, do you see it? You cannot help but saying that, right? Because you want to share your surprise, your wonder. And well, in Mexico City, in Ibi, um, at the EB Congress now in 2014. The issue again was about inclusion. This, this was the main theme. So we presented there, and I have to say that I was very happy because it was a lot of interest in this huge international community for this work and this way to 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 to, to talk and to, to to let's say make questions to dialogue with wordless books and children's books. And well, I. Uh, I, I take the, the last few minutes of my intervention just to, to show you something else. Of course, with wordless books, there are many, many things you can do. And uh, we've seen about plot some and other. And here is a project that we've done collecting wordless books in all the world, aimed to build a library for uh, migrant and non-migrant children in the island of Lampedusa, which is in the center of the Mediterranean, very sadly known for migration tragedies. And well, this is one uh, exhibition, for example, that we've done. You know, it's very handmade, but you recognize lots of you recognize different things. Well, after being part of this wonderful uh, group and being in that, and I look forward the next things to do together. I have been looking at what children do with wordless books with a different attention, also having read the studies of my wonderful colleagues that I have. So what we can do is to go through wordless book, um, making different activities, being creative. It's like when you go outdoor with children, you take you the risk of what is going to happen, and they will put the words. They will, they will, they will exercise. And what is going on between one image and the other? I am thinking about this. This is just a glance at what I'm studying now. Is that there is a way to know the word that passes through images? This is it. What my bridge? Probably you know these images, it's very famous. He was asked, the photographer in the 19th century, he was asked to, he was asked to discover, let's say, to see the horses. When they run, they would put all the four legs up in the same moment. You know, someone was paying the photographer to discover this. The photographer put 24 cameras, 24 cameras, where the horse was was running, you see? So the click would take the images, and the images would tell something that the human eye could not see directly, you see? So as I see, it's not just that image, a sequence of images, 
can tell something that the human eye can, can see, but maybe it can also say, images can say what we cannot say with words. This is very important in education because this means that we have little picture and also the big picture, as you say in English, the big picture, the big questions to be faced with children in our classroom. So this is the challenge that uh, Wordless Book give us. For example, here you see a morning of a normal day and a child is doing something, but the sequence of image tell you something about the atmosphere in which this experience is going. This, this is another book talking again about connection, about people trying to connect each other in images. So what I look forward is to, to go on in this direction to find really ways to go through children's wordless books, finding more and more connection. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Carmen and Evelyn and Teresa to have me with you. Thank you. Thanks. And now we would like to leave some minutes for you. If you have specific questions that any of all three can address, please, uh, you know, go ahead. We will gladly listen. Did you see any like particular advantages over using that, like particular book over any like other wordless books about the subject? Like, was there something that they might find interesting about that? About the arrival, you mean? Mm -hmm. Over other books? Well, uh, the, the Arrival is a unique piece because it is like a graphic novel. So its lens uh, brings the opportunity to look at immigration in an in-depth way that no other book, no other wordless books does. And we wanted to use wordless books because these children uh, were recent, uh, recent immigrants, recent arrivals, and we didn't want the issue of language in the text to be a constraint, or for them to feel like it was another school task that they had to complete. So we thought, okay, given the language processes that they are going on through to learn a language, let's have this wordless text, because we do know that they read images. You know, you go everywhere in every country and you can find, you know, the restroom or things like that. So we live uh, uh, using our visual literacy uh, potential. So we thought that it, that was the main reason because of the depth that the book brings to the topic of immigration and the, the nature of being a wordless one. Can I just yes. because I forgot, for example, for us, we didn't put in the, our main aim of research the learning of the language. It was not our first aim. But when, they, when, when we went back and interviewed children, at the end of these five weeks, and this could happen because the arrival is so long, as Carmen said before, we found out that for them, the first incredible new thing that they got was that they said, they improved their Italian, their language skill a lot. And we were surprised because it happened that during, ex during the common experience, every one of us was so forced to say what he was saying, what he was seeing, what he wanted to express, what he really wanted to share, that the language in itself was just being shaped from our wish and from our experience. And it just came out as, you know, when you're lost in the city and then you know the city. So a really, really interesting learning process. Yes, and Chantal itself, he has a, a couple of pictures in which he presents the immigrants, like not knowing the language because it is a strange place, strange uh, kinds of uh, symbols. And then he's, the other person is communicating with him through gestures and those references to language learning, language uh, empire, uh, led uh, the children, uh, for sure in Arizona, to talk about being bilingual. The possibilities and the difficulties when you get to a new country, and because there was a girl from Iraq, the children were so surprised to learn that she was bilingual. Because in the mind of this Latino kid, bilingual meant to know Spanish and English. 
So when I said, well, she's bilingual. Uh, and what? You are bilingual? Yes, I speak another language. What language do you speak? And so she spoke. <laughs> and her, that, it, it, was, it was amazing. And so the topic of language was always there, but we didn't organize the discussions to learn about language. Is that language was learned through the meaningful sharing and the desires to express their ideas. Yes, Patrice. Thank you so much. This was a fascinating I wanted to know a little bit more about the mediators, um, as we call them in your presentation. And uh, you mentioned that the children said it's not the same to imagine as to having lived it, as having felt what it is to be an immigrant. And also Evelyn, um, Evelyn mm -hmm. she mentioned that some of you are immigrants yourselves mm -hmm. in the country where you were conducting this research. So I was wondering who were the mediators and how did they present Portrayed themselves with the students, and did that make a difference? Did you know the difference in that? Mm -hmm. Evelyn, do you want to? Did you listen to the question? Who were the mediators? I mean, if, if being immigrant or not, the mediator had an impact that we could see on the children discussions. no translation and it, it, it was interesting because there were moments in which you could see no one was translated but this kid said something and then the girl from Iraq added something because we were using the images all the time and then just with a comment in English maybe by one that mediated the whole thing it, it was it was a fluid situation uh, and for sure being bilingual did enable the children to use their languages. In Glasgow, there were so many languages, there was no way, but in Barcelona, one of the mediators was a Spanish speaker also, and, and one knew uh, Catalan, right? So there were some conversations in Catalan and in Spanish also. Yeah. Can, can I also just add yes. that the, the fact that we spoke so many languages also led to some very interesting discussions about language itself and comparisons yeah. and uh, where, uh, you know, why, why we speak different languages. For example, uh, one of the boys noticed that my copy of the arrival said emigrantes, because it had the Spanish title. And he was very intrigued by this. And, and, and he was wondering, well, is it the same book, even if it has the title in a different language? Mm -hmm. uh, and this led to a discussion about why we speak Spanish in Mexico, and uh, but that is slightly different to Spain. Said, oh well, it, it must be because the, Spani the Spaniards who came to conquer made you speak Spanish, and he was absolutely right. <laughs> the boy had no knowledge of previous knowledge of this, so it did lead to some very interesting discussions about languages. Sharon, so thank you for sharing the um, international project. It really makes us just see immigration as a shared experience across um, different countries. And so I was wondering, um, from Mr. Tan's book, he doesn't have the numbers in the picture. Were there any um, evidence from the discussion with the children that the, the sequence played a different role when they are telling the stories um, and how that played out for the facilitation of the discussion? Well, a, a, the arrival can be described as a postmodern test. It has been described because 
it, it breaks temporality. So you have stories within the stories. You have, uh, it, it is a layered book. That's why you can just put it in the hands of a kid and expect that he will get a great story of it because it needs some mediation until the kids really get in, into the book. Um, so the, the, there were some images in which those that uh, Marcella um, chose, but they knew that they could go back and forth. So, yeah. Do you have something to add? Maybe just from, I was thinking to the mediator thing, maybe one interesting thing to share is that since we called the, we called the children out of the classroom during the normal school time, so the eight children, they belonged to the theater, they belonged to two class, and so they would be uh, doing, you know, the reading, the visual journey instead of normal class. And so when they were back, of course, they were asked from the other children what was going on and how was it. And they were so enthusiastic that the other ch children, of course, asked to do the same thing. And what happened was that we discussed it with children and we said what we can do maybe is that at the end of our visual journey, we can invite them and you can be the guide. So that was a beautiful chance to see what of the mediator style the children decided to imitate. Because then the travelers became the guides. The mediators became the audience because we were sitting. And the children were so amazing because what they did was that they kept their own styles. For example, someone would be would tell about autobiographical stories from Bangladesh, very good storyteller. Another one was more, you know, pragmatical. So putting the other uh, thing together, so negotiating the sense like a moderator, you know. So you said, you said, you said, we can say things like this. And what they did about the mediator styles that I noticed was to keep all the questions very open, to repeat the name and also the contribution uh, of, uh, of someone, listened very, very carefully. And there was also a disabled little girl, for example, and we noticed how she wanted to express her, her view and how serious and committed all the others were in listening what she would say because they were used at that point to think that it is worthy to listen, it is worthy to discuss about what you see. So that about maybe can give us a little bit of an insight of what mediator style they got more, you see, the, 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 the way to say possible, they would say, ah, uh, Possible. This is possible. This is possible. So opening up to possibilities. That was what, what we tried to do, and they they did it again. So we could think that they left that way. And with the choice uh, with the choice of the mediator term, uh, it was one of those many terms that we negotiated. How are we calling the people who is facilitating? Because there were teachers, there were researchers. At some point, that you know, there were so many roles. So what was in common for all of us was that we were facilitating in a mediation and style the children's uh, interpretive processes. Yes? Um, this might be a bit extraneous or redundant, but I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that it seems so inherently therapeutic. Was that intentional to make it a sort of, I mean, obviously it's intentional to make it a comfortable, safe place to share, but I think also that it's like conscious of the fact that the journey could be very traumatic mm -hmm. um, and being in obviously a place that is completely new is also traumatic. So I'm wondering how much these sessions were therapeutic intentionally. Well intentionally we didn't have that purpose, right. but we had the purpose of providing opportunity for the children to talk and to make meaning. If they didn't want to talk, we didn't push. Right. So there were children who explicitly distanced themselves, and one from Barcelona, from Barcelona was, right, Evelyn said, eh, no, 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 eh, I am not that. I am not, so he distanced himself. Um, but certainly for those who took up on the opportunity, eh, it was a great learning experience for all of us, and to see through the 
uh, immigrants, the characters, the protagonist eyes, what he went through because he suffered. So Chantal doesn't paint this uh, romantic narrative of the American dream. You go to the country and yes, at the end, because he ends with his family happy, it was a nice story. No, it wasn't. It was full of uncertainty. Uh, he was uh, kicked out from a job. He, he was, you know, they had to let him go because he read something in the wrong way. And there was suffering. And then uh, Chantal inserts vignettes of stories of other immigrants within the largest narratives of children being uh, uh, workers and uh, uh, d different experience, war, you know, death. So there are some uh, scenes, but um, they are integrated in such a way that what the children were able to, you know, we mediated the discussions also. But uh, we can see the potential uh, of the book and more simple books. So we started with a simple one, Flotsam. That's a, a, a good one, funny, very colorful. We wanted the kids to get used to talk about images. So we didn't use this right from the start. We decided, no, let's go with this one, which is about the journey of this camera that goes to the sea after one kid takes a photo, another kid finds the camera in another country, opens it, reveals the photo, takes another photo, and he is in the photo. So if the camera keeps going through the sea, and so it is a journey. And at the end, the last kid has the picture with the photo of the kid who found the camera, who found the camera, who found the camera. It's a layered story. Um, so it served as a nice transition to the arrival, but we, we didn't push when, when the kids, we follow, we follow them, and we had some prompts to move the story forward. Yes. And when you chose the uh, participants, the children, were they any uh, kind of criteria for you to choose? Yes, from? yes, okay. the main criteria was that they had to have their schooling experience <coughs> interrupted in their countries of origin. So they had to have, even if it was kindergarten in their countries, if that existed, formal schooling, at least one year. And so because of that, we calculated, we were looking for kids of 10, 11 years old, more or less, and because you cannot, the book is dense. So it had to be fourth or fifth grade, so it was a combination of things. But yes, there was a criteria, because as we said at the beginning, some kids just wanted to participate, and uh, we welcomed them. And we just took note of that in the research and in the excerpts that we presented. We tried to <coughs> focus on the immigrant kids. If there were others, we identified if there was a kid from Scotland or from Barcelona, we, we said it in the excerpt so that the reader knows uh, who is talking. Any place of economic status? No, not at all. No. No, we wanted to, to welcome everyone. And I went to a public school. And uh, I don't know the nature of your kids in terms of a uh, social class, or were they public schools, Evelyn? No, they, they were government schools. That is, <coughs> they're schools that are open to everybody. And I also wanted to say that that's where some of the ethical issues came up, because there were some children who were not able to tell us you know, exactly how old they were, or exactly how long they had been in the country, or with who they had come. So that was another reason that we were, you know, we didn't want to pressure them into saying things that they had been told they couldn't tell us. Yes. Any other question? Yes. Did you think at all about um, how this kind of activity could be applied to groups of other ages, even younger kids who don't have very much literacy awareness, or older kids who maybe, I don't know, picture books would be seen as something Yes, for sure. We can see that, that it can be used. And uh, there were a variety of wordless texts that can be used with very little kids. And um, these with authors, because this is a complex book. So you can even have you know high school students trying to make sense of it. Right. So you want to go here? If you want to, <coughs> you can share. There are a few that I brought from Italy because they are supposed to be first or in Yes, and, and, yes, and I prefer the list of wordless books for younger readers 
and for other readers here published in the U.S. So the, there, is, there is variety. And now for uh, the project that Evelyn is doing right now, using uh, the Caperucita Roja, can you say it briefly? The age of the kids you are working with now? Evelyn, can you hear? Yes. Uh, Thank you. Thanks a lot.